If you really want to improve your photography, one of the best things that you can do is head to a workshop. The problem is, to get the most out of it, you need to know exactly what to do before you go to the workshop, as well as during the workshop, so that your images end up as good as they can possibly be. Today, we discuss good and bad workshops and good and bad participants on this episode of Behind the Shot. <laughs> Hi, welcome to another episode of Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. This is the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. And I watched a conversation the other day on Facebook about how people improve their photography by going to workshops. The problem was many participants at workshops just aren't really good to be in a workshop with, and they can ruin the experience. And for that matter, some workshop instructors tend to shoot their own shots more than they help the participants, people who paid to go to the workshop shoot. So I thought, really, if you want to get behind a shot and all the people trying to improve by going to workshops, maybe we should dive into this a little bit. And I thought, who better than somebody who leads some of the best workshops that there are? And that's Rick Salmon. Rick, how are you doing, man? Well, thank you so much, Steve, for having me on. It's always fun. And uh, yeah, I think this is a great, great topic because, you know, I've been I've been doing workshops for about 20 years and, <laughs> and I've seen it all, my friend. I, I can imagine. And it's funny, you were in the conversation that I saw on social media about good and and bad workshop participants, and you did a blog post on it. And that is kind of what started you and I talking about why don't we do this in, in into a, a, a podcast? And there will be a link, by the way. In the show notes, thisweekinphoto.com, find Behind the Shot and find episode uh, number 21. And uh, the blog post I'm talking about will be in the show notes with the information on this, uh, along with a bunch of other stuff on on Rick and, and, and stuff like that. So, Rick, you are, um, first of all, I should say, you were a previous guest on Behind the Shot. We did one of your Route 66 shots. Yep. It was episode number eight that you were on. And let me just give a quick synopsis, quick introduction of you once again. As far as I'm concerned or know about, you are the most published photographer probably out there. 35 something, almost 40 books. It's going to be almost 40 by next year. I'm going to have a new book at Photoshop World. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And speaking of Photoshop World, you are a Kelby One instructor. Yep. You've got 13 classes online at Kelby One, but also you teach at Photoshop World. Um, we mentioned that you do seminars. Uh, you do workshops. You are a Canon Explorer of Light, which is uh, a rare thing. Not many people are, but I've actually had three of them on on this podcast. Um, and you are, I, I, by the way, I've never asked you this. They call you the godfather of yeah. photography. Where did that come from? You know Trey Radcliffe? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, Not personally, was, but I mean, I know who he is. Yeah. So Trey Radcliffe, amazing photographer. He came out with this book, uh, H, My World in HDR, or something like that about... Uh, about, uh, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. So he was going to be uh, in New York speaking. So I went to interview him when I had my own podcast. So I walk into the room and he said, Rick, it's such an honor to meet you. You're the godfather of photography. <laughs> I, I love be that. And, because and, I'm like, and it's I'm fitting because like, you've been around, you've been doing this for how long? Well, he's a kid. He's a kid. I'm, I'm 67. He must be in his, you know, 40s or something like that. So, you know, I could be his godfather. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I, I'd love to get him on the show at some point in time. That would oh, be he's awesome. Oh, he's an amazing uh, a photographer. What I like and, about uh, Trey Ratcliffe is he has an eye nobody else has. I mean, when you see his pictures, he has a very unique voice that is Trey Ratcliffe and Trey Ratcliffe only. That is true. Um, so I mentioned your books and there will yes. be a link to, again, your website, your social media stuff uh, in the blog post. But your books, you've got composition, pre-visualization and all kinds of th stuff. And I think that really some of those book topics are really kind of, to me, what workshops are about, right? I mean, your books are not coffee table books of just photography. No. They are instructional. Well, pe people go on a workshop to learn, you know. And they want to see, you know, what I'm seeing. So, you know, I'm there with my camera. I mean, I take a shot and I show the people, you know, the lighting. For example, so in one of the pictures or two or three of the pictures that we're going to be showing, one of my ideas was, okay, the light's coming from this way. I say, move around the subject in an arc like this to see how the shadows are changing. Right here, there's the, it's very flat lighting. So, you know, the lighting's not going to change or the shadows aren't going to change. So I go around quickly taking snapshots, not looking for gesture, which is the main thing, right? 
but and showing the examples. But there are uh, instructors, like you said, who have to get that perfect shot first before everyone else shoots. And I was actually on a workshop as a co-leader with someone, and this is what the person was interested in doing. And uh, I said, I'm never going to do a workshop with that person See, again. Yeah, I don't understand a workshop instructor uh, uh, caring more about their own portfolio yeah. than they do about the people who want to learn from them. I mean, in radio, which is, I've been in radio for 37 years. Um, in radio, we have, you know, a, a kind of a standard rule, and that is respect your audience. They, they're, they're listening to you driving. They're spending their family barbecue time listening to you on the radio. Respect what they're doing and live their life with them. Yes. And that doesn't happen in photography. Well, it, it happens sometimes. You know, one of the pictures, I don't know if you could find it easily, but there's a picture of me teaching that we're going to be showing. Uh, it's not the greatest uh, lighting, but I'm like directing the subjects where if we were photographing this cormorant fisherman. We, we could get to it later, but basically, you see, I'm like directing the subjects, trying to give them all my vast godfather years of advice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> try to try. There you go. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, get down low, see eye to eye, shoot eye to eye. So the person looking at the picture can relate more to the subject. And, you know, I'm saying, watch the background. So I'm ensuring, I want to make sure, and any one of my workshop students, Steve, who's listening to this will tell you this is true. In every situation like this, before we leave, I say, is everyone here 100% happy? And if they're not happy, I say, well, let's take the shot again. But that, that's, uh, that's one of the chants on my workshops. And, and when we, we do get into this shot later, and, and there's a lot I want to actually talk about on this shot. Uh, and I'll wait, because there are some other things that I want to go through. But if you could give me an idea as far as workshops, when you're dealing with workshops, are we talking about workshop leaders? Are they instructors? Are they guides? Are they both? What do you do about all of that? Well, in China... Uh, we had, we had two. In China, we had two instructors. Uh, my, my good friend, Ken, I have to, I have to re read how to spell his name. It's Kashkela, Ken Kashkela. And uh, so we were the leaders, but we had two, we had actually four guides, two main guides and two other guides that were helping us uh, make the pictures. Uh, and they are other guides there, Andy Beals and, and Mia, his, his wife, <coughs> And our other assistants, we actually had, in some situations where we couldn't, uh, they speak Chinese, in situations where the subjects weren't as close as we saw in the recent picture, the subjects had cell phones. So like on the rice paddy, so if they're far away, we're, direct, <laughs> we're directing them uh, via cell phone. So, you know, I, I say, you know, when you go out to a place like this, you should think like you're, you could think, like your Francis Ford Coppola, a director, what are you going to do to make the picture? You're just not going to stand there, you know, and take the shot. This this picture, by the way, never would have found this place. This is at a remote location in China. Uh, Trey Ratcliffe, by the way, has an amazing shot from here. His is a little wider. Uh, and, uh, you know, without the guides, we wouldn't have gotten there. So we get up early in the morning. This was a 500-foot uh, stair climb up to this uh, with gear. We had some Sherpas on some other days, but uh, this is a, just an incredibly beautiful scene. So I wanted to make, it's an HDR shot, So because uh, the contrast range was so great. Canon 5D Mark IV uh, in-camera HDR shot. So I wanted to make sure everyone's getting, so I'm talking about the placement of the horizon line. I'm talking about placing the main subject off center. So I and my friend Ken Kashkala, <laughs> uh, we're really trying to help the participants make the shots, and again, it's that it's that that question. Are you hundred percent happy? And we don't leave until people say yes. So as I'm as I'm looking at this shot, I, I, and you mentioned Sherpas. So when when people are looking to get the best workshop experience that they can, they obviously want to do a little research on the instructors, look at reviews on their workshops, things like that. But I'm guessing also you need to know based on where you're going is. Is it just a guy that happens to live in China that goes, I'm going to take everybody here? Or do they have proper guides and proper assistance to get the gear and the people where the, where the best locations are? Well, we always find the best guides. And I do a lot of research, Steve, on the guides. These people that we work with over there, 
We're going to be looking at some of these Cormer and Fisherman there. They're two brothers. We wound up in their house, actually, afterwards, and they're posing for us. And uh, the, these people uh, are just so good. But it's, it's the same thing if we do, uh, if you go to Iceland, right? If you go to Iceland, you want to know what time of day you should be here to get the best light, you know, for the capture the light at the waterfall. Or if you're going to, uh, we're doing a workshop coming up on the Oregon coast. We plan this at low tide, so all the uh, starfish and the sea anemones are exposed. So we we know, we tell the people, okay, you have to wear uh, Neos, you know, waterproof uh, boots. Right, right. The rubber boots. So, you know, it's all planned out. You don't want unpleasant surprises on a, on a workshop. And here, we, we, told, we had rain, told people to bring rain jackets, rain pants, uh, hats, uh, and you had to be in good physical, physical condition because some of these... This rice paddy uh, picture that we're looking at, that wasn't that hard a walk. But anyway, these women down there, A, they're in red, right, which helps to make uh, the uh, the photograph. But they have cell phones, so they're pretty far away. This was taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens at 200 millimeters. So we're, you know, in composition, you were talking about this before, separation is so important. So we're... We wanted them separated from the walls of the rice patties, but we also wanted them separated, and we wanted to get a reflection. So we're directing them, and it took a little while, but you know, wait, wait, we, they had. So you're calling them on a cell phone to tell them move to your right, right, left, backward, forward, separate. Yeah, it was. It's uh, yeah, we're make we're making the picture. I would say, yeah, we're on this little hilltop, and they they were down. Uh, they couldn't hear us if we were screaming, right? Hey, move to the left. So uh, they had cell phones. So when you're when you're doing a workshop and when somebody's looking at going out on a workshop and you're going to be yeah. traveling to photo locations, right? Right. Um, the travel to these locations. Is that something people should consider, too? Is is the person getting a bus to take everybody? Is it a bunch of Ubers? I mean, yeah, we well, we uh, we organized everything from when we got picked up. Uh, we were in a nice, very, uh, very, very nice bus. Everyone felt like they were in business class. And you do want to find out in advance. You don't want to, you don't want to be crammed in a bus. So you don't want to be crammed in, you know, a small little uh, SUV, right? Although we did take SUVs up to, up to one of the mountains. So, again, I don't think you want to have any surpri big surprises, un unpleasant surprises for the uh, students. Um, you want to, the food is very, very important to people, right? People have dietary restrictions. So when we send out something, you know, the... Uh, the questionnaire you know are you allergic to anything do you need diet coke like rick <laughs> who's addicted to it uh yeah so, i've got one sitting next to me actually as yeah. we speak so uh so we, hey look at this I, I have my diet coke here there we go that <laughs> uh, they should sponsor this now they, they should sponsor that uh and they don't have diet coke in china but they do have coke zero anyway uh yeah surprises you don't you don't want you don't want the people to have surprises you know oh you know Actually, I did one workshop, and we get this uh, a location, and uh, the guy said, "Okay, everyone has to share a room." You know that that was a big surprise. So I'm not doing workshops with that guy. So I, I think you want to uh, people who are listening to this who want to go on workshops, look at the possible pictures, think about how you could make similar pictures or your own pictures, and uh, you don't want any you don't want any unpleasant surprises. So so let me ask you a question because when you're talking about um you know, workshops in general, the instructor plays such a huge role. And you mentioned you had a, on your China one, you had a, you and somebody else that, that were Ken. doing it. And a lot of times there's more than one instructor, yeah. but let's say you're, you know, I, I have never been on a workshop yeah. and, oh my gosh, I really want to go to China or I really want to go to Iceland or, you know, Wherever. the Maasai Mara or something like right. that. And I've never been, and I'm looking up instructors and I'm trying to, to figure things out. What should people expect reasonably because some people have unreasonable expectations i understand that but what should people reasonably have in their mind to expect from an instructor well first and foremost to, to learn a lot okay a uh so you want to go in the youtube channel like you could see like here here's a picture of me i'm letting everyone stand in front of me to get the shot and i'm standing behind because <laughs> i don't want someone to say oh rick salmon you know he's in front you know grabbing the best shot uh, there's my friend Randy Hanna, by the way, in the blue uh, shirt there. He, he was actually he's a professional photographer who came on came on the trip. Uh, so anyway, I think it's the the uh, 
the photographer's personality. Like I tell people that you're going to have a lot of fun in my workshops. You know, I, 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 I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. And, you know, we, we like here, here's another example. We're, di we're directing the, the fishermen talk about that separation. And I wanted to get the cormorant fishermen on the left, you know, uh, like separated. You know, look at that beautiful silhouette. That's because he's in that light. So we're directing them. Just okay, move. wait a minute. I, I need to stop you on that one because, and this is, this is why pictures work so well, right? I look at this mm -hmm. and in my head, Rick mm -hmm. Salmon is standing on a shore somewhere and these guys are going down the river and Rick Salmon snapped a picture, <laughs> took no, a picture. You're telling me, these were effectively models you were communicating with to say, you know what? You're like the, the guy in the foreground, right? I'm pointing right. at this like somebody can see me yep. point. I don't know yep. what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> um, the guy in the foreground, yep. his body shape. I don't even know if you noticed this. He is not over the shadow of the mountains. He's exactly. in the light of the mountains, but his exactly. body shape, his shoulder tucks in where the mountain silhouette tucks in. Yeah. Well, th that was luck. Uh, that was luck. But we, this, we got there in the pitch dark. We're there in the dark. This was taken, I think this picture was taken at like ISO, you know, 8,000 or something like that, because uh, there wasn't a lot of light there. But uh, so we're, we're there waiting for the light to come up. And the guides that we work with there uh, know the light. They know the mountains. They know exactly where we should stand. There were, there were probably 12 people on, the, uh, on this little rock uh, I have a behind the scenes shots, but not in the shots that you have. There are 12 of us standing there, just moving back and forth, uh, making sure that everyone uh, got a shot. And there were people who got different shots. Maybe they just took the picture of the fisherman in the uh, foreground or the fisherman in the background. These guys are brothers, by the way, and they're like in their 60s. I mean, <laughs> these are the last, uh, some of the last calmer and fishermen. But the, the workshop, you know, it's fun. In, in this example, too, we did not leave there until I said, is everyone 100% happy? Because, you know, there's no reason not to get the shot. Uh, this is actually a dumb luck shot. We were photo. Look at that Rembrandt lighting on this woman. Uh, I like the shot with the light coming in through the door. Uh, we were just photographing her. Then someone opened the door and this light came streaming through. So, again, everyone got a slightly different shot. But here, you know, the most important thing is the woman's face. So I was making, I was telling the students, you know, look, you know, light illuminates shadows defined. Look where those shadows are falling. The, the shadows add a sense of depth and dimension to the picture. This is a very, very low light situation. Might have been, in, you know, even higher than ISO 8000. Um, I, for, I forget. I could check. Yeah, it, it always cracks me up, though, when I, when I talk to uh, landscape photographers that they talk about, you know, ISO 1000, it was so dark. Yeah, right. And, and you know, I shoot at 6,400 or 3,200. Oh, in what for your I shoot. rock concerts, yeah. Yeah, all, all the time. So let yeah. me ask you this. Um, somebody, again, they're looking at going on a workshop. Yep. And, or they've signed up for a workshop, right? Yep. There are things I imagine that a photographer can do pre-workshop, before the workshop, to make sure that when they're actually out there, they get the most from it. What what can a participant do to best prepare for yep. going? Well, it depends on the workshop. Uh, if they're going to go to the Maasai Mara and photograph running animals, you could practice photographing a squirrel in your backyard, or better yet, you know, go to a zoo and practice, you know, uh, practice, you know, see how different lenses affect depth of field, right? And maybe if uh, if you're like, there's a place at the Bronx Zoo here called Jungle World where the monkeys are jumping around. Uh, you know, practice the action, uh, practice, you know, this picture, you know, uh, I forget who said it, but, uh, someone said, if you want it, want an interesting photograph, find an interesting subject. Like this man was playing this uh, little uh, musical instrument, but it's the light on his face. Again, I've, I, I'm composing it. So his nose and his profile is against that black area in the back. So we have that uh, separation, but this is the light is streaming in from the side. So if you're gonna, if you know you're gonna be photographing people like this, you could practice photographing someone playing guitar. Uh, you know, in your in your kitchen. I've known people to actually photograph mannequins with uh, lighting. I, yes, actually, because I have you get a, the 3D effect. Yep, I have a. I actually have a, a book where I have some pictures of uh, 
mannequins. Yeah, this picture was taken at ISO 4000. I just checked. And this one. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm going to check as you're speaking uh, ISO 2000. But I'm using one of these ProMaster LED lights with a little uh, warming filter over it to light the man's face. So it was very, very dark. And this is one of the Cormorant fishermen, by the way, who's posing for us. So we knew in advance through our guides, we're going to be going to their house. We're going to be able to get, you know, shots like this. Um, so and that's what makes a shot like this is you look at the, a shot like this and you think great travel photographer captured the moment. I really get <laughs> it feels like they're just watching this guy go on with his day and capturing a moment almost. For, for, you know what? It's almost photojournalistic. Well, until it you like understand that. that you made the shot, you didn't just stand there and photojournalism take the shot. You used no. light. We make the picture. And and everyone, everyone on the workshop got a similar shot. My wife got a shot like this with her iPhone. You know, it's a little noisy. <laughs> but but she was able to get a shot like this. So I think the whole idea, we're, we're in another location here with this beautiful light. I think what makes this shot is a... Um, is the uh, the fabric there that is kind of torn and how her face is uh, just framed there. But everyone on the workshop in this farmhouse got this type of picture. And one thing, they, on some workshops, people hog. You know, like if they really want to get a shot of the other Cormoran fisherman or that woman, they, they'll shoot. So I, as a kind of like, I have to be the policeman. I say, okay, <laughs> let's give someone else a turn. Because, you know, we can't, you, you talked about respect before, Steve. The number one thing in people photography is respecting the subject. And, all, you know, these people are not professional models, right? They have these strangers, right, from all around. The, we had people from all around the country and a person from Australia. Uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is overstay your welcome. And so sometimes I do have to be the p policeman. You know, sometimes I I'm sitting back thinking, okay, so people now understand that they can do research on the, the workshop. They can understand their gear. They can understand how to add light and shoot at high ISO and things yeah. like that. But then when they get on the workshop, um, and I've seen this in things that I've led, you know, concert photography workshops, whatever. When they get on the workshop, boom, it's all gone out of their mind, right? It's suddenly, you know, oh my gosh, I have to get the shot and the stress and the thinking and the planning goes out. So, in a number of different ways, there are things that participants can do while they're there to make sure they get everything they need from it. One of which I will throw out is talk to the instructor. Tell the instructor what you expect and what yeah. you hope to get out of it. Even if it's unrealistic, make sure you make your wishes known. But what else can somebody do to get the most while they're in the workshop? Well, actually, it's funny you say that because when Ken and I were teaching this workshop, the first thing I do is... So, you know, I, I say, I think I'm a good photographer, and I think Ken is a good photographer. I think uh, I'm a good leader. I think he's a good leader. And I said, and Ken didn't know I was going to say this, I said, Ken's really bad at something. So Ken's face goes like this, my co-leader. I said, Ken's really bad at something, and he's bad at the same thing that I'm bad at, and it's mind reading. And this is what I say. We're both bad at mind reading. We don't know if... You know, if you don't know what's, you know, how to expose for the highlights. We don't know if you're not checking your histogram. We don't know. You have to show your picture. So there is a, there is a responsibility that the, uh, you know, and we, we, get, we send out a questionnaire. You know, instructors, you know, performance, location, blah, blah, blah. And the, the first night, I hold that up and I say, we're going to send this out at the end. And there's no reason... If you speak up, if you, the more you put in, the more you get out, that we shouldn't get, you know, tens on everything. Because w that's why we're here. You have to speak up. You know, we don't want to hear at the end, oh, Rick didn't spend enough time with me in Photoshop. Uh, I needed to know more about adjustment layers. It's your responsibility. See, and when I used to teach computers, I, uh, we, we got rated by every student at the end of every class. And so when I did one of my workshops, I think it was back in February or something for the group that I, I'm involved with, uh, i.e. PPV, you've been there before. Um, oh, yeah. I decided to kind of introduce that and I created my own review sheet and I gave it out to the participants and said, look, review me honestly. I don't care. Yeah. Instructors who do not want to be rated by their students to me are a problem. Yes, it's uncomfortable to the instructor, but 
it isn't as bad as you'd think if you did a good job. So when when you're talking about you know being on a on a workshop, you can have good instructors, you can have bad instructors. You can also have good and bad participants. So give me some examples of how people when they're on a a workshop can be the good participant. And I'll, uh, while they, you're talking, I'm going to throw some pictures up and just kind of, yeah, I'll flip yeah. through them and let people see some of your China pictures. I, but give us an idea of yeah. good behavior on a workshop I, and toss in some bad behavior. You yeah. know, what people can not, should not do on a workshop. Well, they shouldn't really hog the spot. I was in this blog post that you mentioned before. It's called the bad workshop behavior, what people could find, you know, Rick Salmon, bad workshop behavior. And, and there'll be a know, link in the show notes, by the way. I have a link in there. Uh, uh, we were in this place, and someone was hogging the spot. Like here, this is the where those cormorant fishermen. The shot that we showed you with the separation before. Uh, here, we're just shooting in the other way. Uh, everyone, you know, there's here. There was one spot where the bird is like uh, isolated up there in the mountain, and you have the other cormorant uh, on the on the left there. There's really only one spot I feel for the best picture. You know, Ansel Adams said. <laughs> You want a good picture, knowing a, uh, a good picture really depends, something like it depends on where you're standing. So if someone's taking, you know, 57 pictures of this, you know, that's bad workshop behavior. I say you have to really envision the end result, get in there and shoot and scoot and let someone else, uh, let someone else uh, get in there. So I think share and sharing your pictures is a very, very good idea. And in the processing sessions here, we had a friend that one of my friends was on the workshop, Laura Knight. She was helping teach uh, two or three of the uh, participants Lightroom. So, and so sharing your expertise, I think is very, very important. This was, uh, this was beautiful. 10 minutes before this, it was zero visibility. Uh, the reason we go in May, we're going next year, is because you get this beautiful fog. You get this beautiful uh, fog. Uh, there was a person on this with the drone, and he was so respectful of everyone on the workshop. He waited till everyone got their shot, uh, and then he then he says, "Okay, if I do the drone," and we said, "Sure." Bad workshop would behavior would be to just set your drone drone up and and go right away. This is actually one of my all time favorite uh, travel portraits. Uh, I talked about gesture before. Uh, I said something to to made her to to make her laugh. She was posing for us, and it was a nice enough shot. But everyone wanted to get a shot of her, so I said, "Okay, do this, do this, do this before," and set your cameras up. And everyone got basically, you know, a similar shot. So part of your responsibility, I think, as a workshop participant, is I say, well, "You have to know how to shoot in manual," <laughs> because if I'm saying, you know, put your ISO with this, do this, do this, as a starting point, you know, if if you you know, you, you don't want to slow other people down. And that includes being back on the bus be, uh, or leaving bad workshop behavior is being a second late on my, <laughs> on my workshops. We, I say we're leaving on iPhone time. You know, if you're five minutes late, you're going to mess it up for everyone else. So well, and you mentioned the drone people. If you have a drone, that's fine, but yeah. don't fly it in front of people's shots, right? Yeah. Um, don't stand in front of people and hold your camera up in the air. Right. Because you may be in other people's shots that are behind you. So there's there's normal, you know, a good way to word it is etiquette, right? Yeah. It's it's respect other people. But also, I, I think it's, I don't have it here, but I think that it's in the blog post. You had a photo somewhere, I, maybe it's not in the blog post, uh, your blog post, I mean, um, where participants are actually holding diffusers and reflectors and lights for other participants. Yep. So that's a part of the learning experience, right? If, if, if you know, yes. Jimmy is taking a shot and you really want to learn photography, grab a reflector or a diffuser and learn how to help Jimmy yeah. take a better shot. We all, we all help each other. We all help each other. And sometimes, you know, some participant, you know, big person like this, my friend Randy, he's helping people carry the tripods, you know, and it's, you're, really, you're really in a team. And, and I think that's how you have to look at it. It's really a team effort. So you, we started with a shot I want to bring up. And to me, this is the, the, the definition of, and this is a saying I got from you. I quote you all the time, your salmonism, salmonisms. Um, a couple from Zach Arias that always stick in my head too, like head in a clean spot. Love I love the saying head in a clean spot, which is really earlier what yeah. you were talking about where right, you separation. made sure people were in a clean spot. 
But, and that is the difference between taking a shot and making a shot, right? One mm -hmm. of your Route 66 shots at the at the motel, the Swallow Motel, uh, you pulled out a hose. You asked the guy to move the car. Yep. You pulled out a hose because you thought this would look better if there was a reflection. And you watered the, the driveway down so that there was a reflection. So when people go on a workshop and they're helping each other out, what things can somebody do on their own? Now, in this picture, I'm about to bring up, you're doing it, but... What people? What what can people do on their own to uh, make their shots rather than just take their snapshots? I think uh, moving around the subject, you know, to see, you know, when you're using lights, you know, two inches can make a difference. Maybe one inch can make a difference. So I would say move or move around the subject. Use your camera actually like a drone. You know, move it up, move it down. These people are crouching down. Uh, to, to, again, to see eye to eye and to shoot eye to eye. You notice in this picture, everything in this scene is in focus. And uh, I think I have, uh, no, it's not of the pictures that I, that I sent you. Uh, the end result of these people were shooting at a small aperture, focusing one third into the scene, a little bit behind the subject. So everything was in focus, uh, which, was, which was the goal. What so, are the two people standing doing waiting their turn they're so waiting they're they're good workshop participants <laughs> that's my friend randy hannah and his wife uh kathy both excellent photographers they're waiting their turns and they, actually the man in the orange saw a picture i had taken on the pre-workshop we did a scouting mission and he said i'd love to get a shot like that so these two people are working to get the shot after that done randy and Catherine are going to come in and then there's you know here behind this there's the you know, you know, the eight or 10 other workshop participants and the guides all behind the scenes here, wait patiently waiting their turn to make a, make a picture. Which, which makes the, sense. Who, by the way, who took this picture? Uh, my wife, Susan. Okay. And so as you're looking at this and people are trying to make shots, um, you're directing them. Did you direct the guy in the boat? And, it, it, you know, again, I'm thinking workshop yes. participants, right? And sometimes workshop participants spread out over a couple of different right. scenes or settings. So if their instructor or workshop leader is not there with them, what can they do in a scenario like this to get the fishermen to do what they need? Well, first of all, I say another, in addition to saying I'm not a good mind reader the first night, I say stick like glue to the instructor. Stick like glue. Uh, because, you know, I'm there to help the people make the best shots. If, and people do walk off, and they make their own shots, and that's fine. But I think if you want to get the most out of the instructor, and that goes for the processing sessions too, right? Because we have processing sessions. Every workshop leader I know has a processing session. Um, and that's, uh, that's very important. But if people go off on their own, you know, we're, again, we have two, we have four people on this trip with us, four local people who speak Chinese. So they're telling the man, "Can you hold your your lantern up? Could you hold your lantern down? Can you you know? Can you light the lantern? Can you do some other things?" So we're directing it, but people could walk around, you know, uh, and just take take their own pictures, and that's fine. That's, as long as they're they're on time, leaving and coming, that's fine. So really, the, the end result of this whole conversation is, um, do your research. Yep. Make sure you know your gear. That's kind of the pre-preparation thing. Make sure you know your gear. You're still going to learn things, but make sure yeah. you already have a good understanding to to make it so you can absorb new information. Uh, help other people and be courteous and kind and respectful to other people. Yes. Uh, and more importantly, if you really want your shots on a workshop to come out as good as they possibly can, it's not photojournalism. Don't be afraid to get involved direct, uh, ask, request, whatever it is to get the best shot. Well, that's for my type of workshops. Uh, I have a friend, Valerie Jardine, who teaches at Out of Chicago, where I'm going to be uh, this, uh, this coming weekend. Also she a does, podcaster. Yeah, she does street photography. So she's not walking down the streets of Paris saying to the, uh, the man, oh, could you, you know, put, put the, the tea a little closer to your mouth? And, you know, if you're smoking a cigarette, could you hold it away? So she's doing different type, but you know, so she's teaching her techniques, and that's why people go on her workshops. They want to do photojournalism. People might come on my workshops to, you know, learn how to maybe uh, make a picture and do more. Uh, you know, like I say, it's so much fun. Like you're like Francis Ford Coppola out there. What could be better? You know, what well, could and, be more and and in Valerie's case, you know, if you look at Valerie's work, 
um, there is no question that Valerie is very careful on her timing, right? I mean, somebody's walking in front of her camera moving, and yeah. especially if they're silhouetted, which she does some amazing silhouette yeah, stuff in nice. buildings with backlight of windows. Uh, okay, it's a guy silhouetted in most shots. She's careful enough to time that shot right. as they're walking by so that that person is, again, head in a clean yeah. spot, whatever it might be. Now, that said... I don't know how many shots she shows throws away. So it's entirely possible since she can't pose them that she has to wait and try and shoot a couple of people to get it exactly the way she would want it. That's part of that making a shot. Mm -hmm. I, I also have on my workshops, I talk about my one picture promise. And I promise people, I say, if you could only take one picture in this situation, what would that one picture be? And it stops people from just getting into a location like some of these interior shots that, uh, that you showed and just shooting your brains out or being outside and shooting your brains out. You think about, okay, I'm watching the background. I'm watching the subject. If I wait, if I wait till the fisherman is a little isolated or if I wait for that Rembrandt lighting, that lady who was weaving in the red uh, was moving ahead up and down. If I wait, what's, what would be the one picture? And I really do find, Steve, that... Uh, since I started talking about this, people are taking fewer pictures and getting a higher, much higher percentage of uh, keepers. Which, which is really good to know. So I mentioned earlier that on the blog post associated with this, which is going to be on uh, thisweekinphoto.com, find behind the shot, I created a shortcut. It's just behindtheshot.tv. We'll okay. take anybody right to the page that has all the episodes. If you find this episode with Rick Salmon on, on Workshop Good and Bad, um, there will be a link to his blog post where he talks about this. Uh, there'll be a link to Amazon with all of his books if you want to look into the books that Rick has available. And then if people want to reach out to you, I know your website is, you're Rick Salmon almost everywhere. Your website's ricksalmon.com. Yeah. Uh, you're Rick Salmon on Facebook. You're Rick yep. Salmon on Twitter, at Rick Salmon. Uh, Instagram, you're Rick Salmon Photography. Anywhere yep. else people can find out about your workshops? No, that's about it. But your workshops will be listed on ricksalmon.com. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? They're, on, they're on the workshops page. We have two, 2016, uh, no, sorry, 2017, 18, and we're actually planning 19. Wow, you actually. plan that far in advance? Yeah. Uh, we're doing this guerrilla trip, and a lot of these safari camps uh, book that far in advance. And well, uh, again, this is your second time doing this with me, and this is kind of an unusual one in that we're really just talking about how to help people. Yeah on more of a global scale rather than just dissect a shot. And I really appreciate your coming back on as well, always, Rick. It's great to see you, man. Well, you are so much fun. You're so good at what you do and uh, hope to catch up with you soon someplace in I, person. I hope, hopefully we'll sit down and have, I saw you a uh, picture you posted of uh, margarita mix the other night. So hopefully one day soon, Rick Salmon and I will sit down and have a margarita or a good beer, a, a nice Stella or something together. But Again, thank you very much to my guest, Rick Salmon. Check out the blog post for all the information on Rick. And again, this is Behind the Shot, the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look at their shots. Mm -hmm.